Bokatov, good morning. I uh, wish you to know it's rather intimidating and uh, nevertheless uh, very inspiring. Uh, my subject this morning that I've been given is what it's like to be a Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, I've been asked to yap and yap and yap. <laughs> uh, now, it is said that a good speech should always have a good beginning and a good ending, and that the two should be as close together as possible. <laughs> well, I do have a rather good beginning, uh, because I want to say something about uh, what it's like to be an Israeli Prime Minister. Uh, I can sum it up in only one word, tough. <laughs> uh, I, those of you who would have seen my, uh, my bio would know that I had served in one capacity or another with Prime Ministers Levi Eshkol, Golda Meir, Yitzhak Bin, Rabin Menachem Begin, and Shimon Peres. Uh, and I can say this, that from Israel's very first Prime Minister, David Ben Gurion, to the more recent, Ehud Olmert, Ehud Barak. As for Bibi, he's still in the job, so the jury is still out. But from the very outset, ever since the establishment of Israel in 48, no incumbent ever got the premiership he hoped for. For the moment they sit behind that desk, they have to grapple with what is probably one of the loneliest jobs in the world, confronting one of the most intractable conflicts in the world. Now, it is axiomatic that in dealing with that conflict, a leader who does not hesitate before he sends his nation into battle is not fit to be a leader. Yet at the same time, the question that haunts every Prime Minister of Israel is how and when to wield military force in self-defense. And it is my observation that however many facts he has before him or her, they are never enough so that he or she can only guess at the political and the military consequences of his action or inaction. Indeed, at the end of the day, the Prime Minister of Israel has to make the best call he can with the information and judgment at his command, and that can be a very lonely exercise indeed. I've seen leaders, people of profound courage and conviction, in hours of excruciating decision-making stress, like Levi Eshkol in the Six-Day War, Golda Meir in the Yom Kippur War, Yitzhak Rabin at the time of Entebbe, Menachem Begin at the bombing of the Iraqi nuclear reactor. I've seen the look on their faces when their cabinet ministers rise to leave the room once a fateful decision has been taken. The sound of the closing door, the hush that follows, the shudder of knowledge that because of the decision just taken, people are going to die, that the hands on the clock show time is running out, that the inferno shall shortly erupt. At such moments, just before the fuse is about to burn, when there's still time to ponder, at such moments, I've seen such people's lips tremble in prayer, people who have never prayed before, and their prayers have been answered. So faced so very often with solemn-like judgments, often life and death judgments, 
Is it any wonder that our prime ministers, all of them, past and present, have an aversion to anything that smacks of convoluted theorems favored by learned academics? They're all in constant search of bottom line answers. In fact, the best piece of advice I was ever given when I began working in the Prime Minister's Bureau way back in the early 1960s, it came from an old timer who said to me, Yehuda, if you want to succeed in this job, try not to walk into the Prime Minister's room with a problem, only with a solution. But perhaps the greatest lesson of all that I learned in the, is the meaning of the word leadership. We brandish the word, but we seldom define it. On the top of a hill, outside the capital of Australia, Canberra, where I once served, is a lonely gravestone located in the grounds of an isolated homestead. And on it, are etched the words, leadership is wisdom and courage and the great carelessness of self. Strange words, a great carelessness of self. And I take them to mean that true leaders must be ready to risk their own futures in order to do what they deem to be right. It means there are times when a leader must act against the advice of his own experts and confidants and be guided by that little something, that tiny, tiny creature who inhabits an area between the belly button and the brain and which tugs at your nerve ends and whispers in your ear, no, don't go that way, go the other way. By and large, despite their differences, our early prime ministers were all of one piece, meaning they were incapable of being anyone but themselves. They knew little about pollsters and image makers. When they did try to put on a pose, they looked ridiculous. At rock bottom, they had that most elusive yet indispensable attribute of leadership, authenticity. They never wore a mask. Now those founding prime ministers, they were mostly forged in the flames of pre and post World War I pogroms of Eastern Europe and in the revolutions that swirled around them. Some swam to safety in the rivers of the Holocaust blood, and all were steeled in the early desperate battles for Israel's birth and survival. They were statesmen before there was a state, and they were generals before there was an Israel defense army. Agree or disagree with their policies, each earned an authentic stamp of immortality. Theirs was an era of self-sacrifice and noble ideals to which they devoted their lives, which is why all of them died virtually penniless. Not so the new generation. The new generation has been born into a much more materialistic world and a much more global environment where individualism is lauded a material gain is not frowned upon. This is not to detract one iota from Benjamin Netanyahu's abilities as a prime minister in the modern mold. He is a gifted man with a sharp political acumen. He has far more book learning than his predecessors. With a sharp mind, the skills of a good advocate, a master of his material, and one of the finest communicators in the land. But shall he, in this, his third term, have what it takes to lead us into a challenging future as a legendary figure who is at once tough and tender, grave and dry, terribly human, with whom one can laugh and cry, 
an abiding figure in Israeli history with the authentic stamp of immortality? Or shall he resort to improvisation unanchored in ideological constituency? The answer will be found in how he faces up to the challenges of war and peace which might, which might well be confronting him soon. And in confronting them, will he be able to master what his tutor Menachem Begin had taught him? A profound sentiment for the suffering of others combined with an irresistible passion for peacemaking? When Begin met with the next of kin of the fallen in battle, he wept and they wept and there were rivers of tears. But there was also a granite within him and an irrepressible push for progress to peace. And this combination of feeling and granite was what the nation needed then and needs now. True, Begin had a ready peace partner, Anwar Sadat. Is Abu Mazen, president of the Palestinian Authority, a peace partner? Some say yes, some say no. And I say let them come to the table and then both men will be tested. One insuperable problem that every Prime Minister of Israel is up against is that so many of our citizens consider themselves better qualified to do the job than them. And as we read in the Parshiot of these weeks, very weeks in the weekly Torah portion, as Moshe Rabbeinu taught us in the desert, it is difficult to govern the children of Israel. We Jews are famous for our independent mindedness, our penchant for non-conformism, which goes a long way to explaining why Israel already boasts eight Nobel Prize winners and has become a high-tech superpower. And of course, we are not lacking in oddballs too. If you don't believe me, just take a look at our Knesset. <laughs> our Knesset is a robust crucible of democracy at the loudest. I once asked Prime Minister Levi Eshkel, why was this so? What is there about us? I'm talking about 1964. What is there about us that drives us to be so, what shall I say, competitive? And I recall him peering over the tops of his spectacles and saying, my entire younger man, Herzi, uh, Eshkel, he loved Yiddishisms. He said, we're still at war. We're still beleaguered. We still face terrorism. We are still absorbing hundreds of thousands of penniless immigrants. We are a motley bunch of tribes trekking home, each with their own pekelech of neuroses. So how on earth can we be normal? <laughs> he then fell silent, presumably mulling over the enormity of it all, until, with a twinkle in the eye, he said in his famed Yiddish wit, younger man, Disputation is in our blood. We're a stiff-necked people. Argumentation is our nationality. Shouting at each other is what keeps us together. It's what unites us. Eshko was an utterly likable man, a team player with no pretensions. When I first met him, he was 70 years old. Yet his thick-set body, his hefty shoulders, his gnarled fingers and the waddle of his walk still suggested a time in his life when he dug a canal, swung a scythe, pushed a plow, heaved a sack and sweated in dust and heat. The, uh, this was an old pioneer of the fields, an old kibbutznik. After the Six-Day War, President Lyndon Johnson invited him to his Texas ranch to talk things over. And knowing yes, that he'd been a kibbutznik, he probably wanted to show him his acres. So the president took the wheel of his station wagon and drove him off at such high speed across his white fence pastures 
And he spoke so rapidly about the irrigation project he had devised that at one point a bouncing and bewildered Eskol turned to us, we his aides in the back seat, and he called out, Vus Radegoy! <laughs> The one problem I had as a member of his staff, a very junior one I might say, was that he was not at all fussy about Kashrut. In fact, none of the prime ministers I worked for were f fussy about Kashrut until Menachem Begin came into office in 1977. It was only with him that Kashrut at all official functions became mandatory. Before that, whenever there was an official banquet, say at the White House, I would seek out the housekeeper, her name was Mary Lou. I would seek her out, and she was familiar with my dietary needs. And such was the case on a night in June 1975, when President Gerald Ford hosted Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in the state dining room, and present were the Washington elite, Jewish bigwigs, academic celebrities and Hollywood stars all exuberantly chomping on their succulent roasted pheasant, roast potatoes and garnished beans while I sat forlorn before an empty place setting. My vegetarian dish had not arrived. Perhaps this was because my place card on which my name had been engraved, was misspelled. Instead of Yehuda, it read Yeduha Avner. Now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was sitting on my left, and who was flirting with the well-known television personality Barbara Walters on my right, he caught sight of my still empty place setting and craning his neck to mark my name card, he called out, You do ha, you're not eating with us tonight. Whereupon, as if from cue, a butler stepped forward and placed before me a fiesta of color consisting of a base of lettuce as thick as a Bible, topped by a mountain of chopped fruits, capped by a blob of cottage cheese, and all of it was crowned by a scoop of whipped cream, so that the whole thing in a jig stood about a foot high. And in contrast to everybody else's deep brown roasted pheasant, it glittered like a firework. And Barbara Walters began to applaud. And this drew the attention of President Ford, and he whispered something into Prime Minister Rabin's ear, and Rabin whispered something back into his whereupon. The President rose, held his glass high, and beamingly called out to me, Happy birthday, young fella! <laughs> <laughs> and then to the whole room, he said, Let's all sing a song to the birthday boy! <laughs> whereupon, this is the honest truth, the entire dining room rose to his feet and began chanting, Happy Birthday Day You Do Ha! I thought, I, I slink back mortified. <laughs> and after dinner, I asked Rabin, why on earth he told the president it was my birthday? And he shot back in total earnestness. He said, what else should I have told him the truth? <laughs> And tomorrow there'll be a headline in the Israeli press that you ate coach and I didn't. And then the religious parties will bolt the coalition and I'll have a government crisis on my hands. I need my sugar, am I crazy? Well, my friends. Salava. Salava. <clears throat> This was classic Rabin. Rabin was a no-nonsense, straight-as-a-die, chain-smoking agnostic. He was bereft of any charismatic pretensions. He was rather strapped with what I would call an emotional austerity. <laughs> he was shy to a fault. He was uncomfortable with small talk and did not suffer fools gladly. Personal questions embarrassed him. A stranger's innocuous, how are you, could make him cringe, as if his privacy had somehow been invaded. 
Place him, however, within the bosom of his family and his old army pals, his warm passions flowed instinctively. Yitzhak Rabin had that the most analytical mind I've ever come across. Whenever he grappled with an intricate issue, he would mentally analyze its multiple parts, neaten them into a coherent model, then cut right through to the heart of the matter and would say, the issue boils down to four salient points. They are. And he would tick them off one by one with unmistakable clarity. The first time I was witness to this was a day in March 68 at our Washington Embassy. Rabin was then our ambassador and he was preparing for a meeting with Henry Kissinger, who was then Richard Nixon's national security advisor. And Kissinger wanted Rabin's thinking on the recently passed Security Council Resolution Number 242, and most particularly his interpretation of the term in that resolution, secure and recognized boundaries, meaning the boundaries between Israel and its neighbors should be secure and recognized. So what are secure and recognized boundaries? Rabin thought long and hard, and then he said to me, our secure and recognized boundaries have to be these. One, Jews have an historic right to the whole of Eretz Israel. Two, however, there is another people in Eretz Israel. So to ensure that Israel not become a binational state, but remains a democratic and Jewish state, the secure and recognized boundaries we have to seek are those that will give us a maximum of Eretz Israel with a maximum number of Jews whom we can maximally defend. There he was, without frills, without superfluities, and without drawing an actual line on the map, which he did not have the authority to do, he was here offering what I consider to be a superbly conceptual model, one that forever governed his approach to, towards his vision of the future of Eretz Israel, a future as a land, in his mind, of two nations, two faiths, two languages, two historic narratives, and two destinies. Where in our tiny geography that secure boundary should be, nobody has yet delineated. Certainly, certainly, it is not the 1967 line, which is in reality the 1949 armistice line. When Rabin was prime minister in the mid-70s, he engaged in some very tough negotiations with Kissinger, who was now the US Secretary of State. And they were deliberating on the possibility of what was called an interim agreement with Egypt in the Sinai. This was well before the peace treaty. But the talks reached an impasse, and Kissinger was furious, so furious, that at one point he yelled at Rabin Red in the face, Yitzhak! You are creating a dangerous crisis. You will yet be responsible for the destruction of the third Jewish commonwealth, meaning Israel. To which Rabin yelled back, equally red in the face, and I warn you, Henry, you will be judged not by American history, but by Jewish history. Don't you ever forget that. Kissinger stormed out of the room to fly back to Washington and Rabin instructed me to immediately compose and broadcast our version as to why the talks had failed before Kissinger had a chance to broadcast his. But Shabbat was already upon us, so I said to him I would get down to it immediately after Shabbat. And Rabin gave me a look that could freeze water and he hissed, Go and keep your Shabbos. When I returned after Shabbat, he tossed over to me a file of cables from my embassy throughout the world, all of which, without exception, carried Kissinger's version of events and roundly condemned Israel for the breakdown of the talks and the concomitant break, uh, prospect of renewed war. Later, an eminent rabbinic authority he told me that halachically I was wrong 
not to have carried out the Prime Minister's instructions because of the severe political damage inflicted on Israel. And yet, years later, in the mid-90s, during Rabin's second term as Prime Minister, I reminded him of that episode, to which he replied with a very good-natured smile. He said, Yehuda, don't fret. My grandfather would have done exactly the same thing. And then he told me something rather amazing. That his maternal grandfather, Yitzhak Cohen from Petrograd, was one of the few Jews allowed by the Tsarist regime to live in that city. He was allowed to live there because he was a lumber merchant and he managed the forests of some relative of the Tsar. The authorities even installed a telephone in his house, one of the first telephones in the whole of Petrograd. Then Rabin said to me, now I ask you, how many people in those days in Russia had telephones? So when it rang, you knew somebody important was on the other end of the line. Yet my grandfather said he had such strong religious principles that he would never answer the telephone on Shabbat. He could have lost everything, all his privileges, but he would never answer the telephone on Shabbat, whoever was at the other end of the line. Now, as you know, Rabbi was a Palmachnik. And that generation of Palmachnikim, they adulated the visionary declarer of our independence, David Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion was a lover of Tanakh, and in his memorable testimony before the British Royal Peel Commission of 1936, when asked to identify the basis of the Jewish claim to Palestine, he trumpeted without hesitation, gentlemen, the Bible is our eternal mandate. And he was later to say, I quote him, since I invoke Torah so often, let me state that I am not a religious Jew. Yet my passion for Eretz Israel stems entirely from the book of books, which is the single most important book in my life. And this, by the by, is why he persistently urged the secular school system to teach Tanakh, but few were the teachers who were literate enough to do so. Now, my friends, prime ministers have to deliver speeches, lots of them. And I, the English speech writer of five, actually four, because Begin wrote his own, and I simply stylize his language, is what he calls Shakespeareization. <laughs> uh, and indeed, the one prime minister I knew who was a master of rhetoric was Begin. He had perfected his command of English in the underground, listening to radio broadcasts. And uh, he once took as an exercise the words of Benjamin Disraeli calling across the aisle to Gladstone and declaring, quote, the honorable gentleman is a sophistical rhetorician inebriated with the exuberance of his own verbosity. <laughs> that was, Begin was able to quote that to me off by heart as an exercise he had learnt listening to the radio in the underground. Now, privileged and proud as I was to have served Eskol and Mayor and Rabin, all of them illustrious pioneers and Zionist diehards, none of them possessed the depth of Begin's reverence for Jewish tradition, his cozy acknowledgement of God, his familiarity with ancient customs, and his innate sense of Jewish kinship. And by the by, he loved to come here to South Africa. He loved the South African Jewish community, as some of you in this hall might remember his visits. He came from the heart of Jewish Poland, and though not strictly observant in his daily life, he was an old school traditionalist with an infectious common touch which made Jews everywhere feel they really mattered. Not long ago, we marked the 34th anniversary of one of his great speeches, the one he delivered at the ceremonial signing of the peace treaty 
with Egypt on the lawn of the White House. Now I suppose that to every great moment in history, there's always some individual who has a personal farce to tell. And my personal farce on the occasion of that historic speech signing uh, uh, ceremony is that uh, I had unwittingly run off with the Prime Minister's speech in my pocket. He'd early, earlier handed me the draft to stylize and type, but at the last moment he decided he wanted to read his original written in his own hand and it was in my pocket. And the problem was that I was at one location participating in a lunch with the Secretary of State Cyrus Vance and Menachem Begin was at another location lunching with the President. So in utter desperation I brandished the pages in the face of the Secretary of State and I said to him literally with deadly seriousness that unless I get these pages to the Prime Minister within minutes there will be no peace signing ceremony today with Egypt. And Vance looked at me in disbelief, he collared a senior police officer, he ran to a waiting police car and ordered its driver to get me to the Prime Minister's pronto. And the driver hit 80 miles an hour within a single block, upon which he extended his hand to me and said, Shalom Aleichem, my name's A.B. Feingold, and I'm one of four Jewish cops on the Washington Force. When I asked him where we're going to make it in time, he replied, you bet. When A.B. presses on the gas, people know to get out of my way. And to prove the point, he yelled at an aging car, slowing it to light. He peeled around it and made an obscene gesture at the aging driver as he passed. And another car made the fatal mistake of stopping at an intersection. And A.B. raised his siren to an even higher pitch, whereupon he tailgated a poor fellow who mounted a sidewalk in alarm. And within minutes he screeched to a halt in front of our destination and he held out his hand again and he cried, Mazel tov. <laughs> Now, despite their highly charged differing views, Begin and Goldemeyer greatly respected each other. Goldemeyer served as Prime Minister between 69 and 74, and she was all of eight years old when she arrived in America from her native Kiev. And she was a strong-willed and straight-talking woman, a crusading sort, whose Hebrew was filled with Milwaukee-sounding pronunciations, and she spoke with total conviction about her Zionist socialist ideals as if they were a religious creed, so much so that she gave the impression that her left-wing Zionism was her Judaism. Only once in an intimate interview with the world-renowned Italian correspondent Oriana Falacci, did I ever hear her speak of religion? Are you religious? Falacci had asked her, to which she replied with a dismissive wave of the hand, Be religious? Never. To me, being Jewish means being proud to be part of a people that has maintained its distinct identity for more than 2,000 years, despite all the pain and torment. And then she added this, The one time I've ever really prayed, really felt God watching over us was in the Moscow synagogue. This was shortly after the establishment of the state when I was appointed Israel's ambassador to the Soviet Union. And on Shabbat, following the presentation of my credentials, I went with my embassy staff to the Moscow Great Synagogue, knowing that only there could we meet Jews. But we found the place practically empty. However, News of our arrival spread quickly so that when we went a second time, the street in front of the shul was jam-packed. Close to 50,000 people were waiting for me. Despite all the risks, she said, in those Stalinist days, these Jews had come to demonstrate their kinship. Without speeches or parades, they were showing me their love for Israel and the Jewish people and I was their symbol. And then she went on, I prayed together with them. Oh, how I prayed. People were surging around me, stretching out their hands and crying out, Shalom Aleichem Goldala, Good Shabbos Goldala. 
Golda Leibniz also. And all I could say over and over again, ich dank euch, dass ihr seid geblieben, Jeden, I thank you for having remained Jews. And that, she said, was the one time when I really prayed to God. Now, old and tired as she was in 1973, this woman who knew nothing of things military emerged as a great war leader during the Yom Kippur War. Golda was no Venus. She was a Mars. It was during that Yom Kippur War that her faith in the fraternity of international socialism cracked. The socialist heads of European governments with whom she so happily hobnobbed in the socialist international organization, not a one of them came to her aid, to our aid, when we faced our peril during the early days of the Yom Kippur War. Not a one granted landing and refueling rights on their soil for the desperately awaited American airlift that replenished the fast dwindling arsenals of our battered and our bleeding IDF as the war escalated. Golda was beside herself and she ranted and raged against those socialist heads of European governments. And once the war was over, she demanded the emergency meeting of the Socialist International. And in her address, she asked her comrades, I quote, Is the Jewish state a rightful member of this socialist fraternity? Or are we irredeemably the odd state out? I just want to understand, in light of the life and death struggle we have just faced, what socialism is really about these days. You did not allow one inch of your territory for refueling of the American airlift that saved us from destruction. Now suppose the Americans had said, sorry, we can't help you, because the Europeans won't allow us to land and refuel and on their territory. And she added, believe me, I do not belittle your interests in the Middle East. There are 22 Arab states, boundless energy, billions of dollars, oil. So of course I understand what your interests are. But what I want to know from you today is whether the socialist values we stand for are decisive factors in your thinking too. Or do they go by the board in the case of the Jewish state? With that she sat down and the chairman asked if anybody wanted to respond and nobody did. The silence was palpable. And it was only broken when a man's voice behind her whispered audibly, of course they won't talk. They can't talk. Their throats are choked with oil. Golda subsequently told me that she never did find out whose voice that was. She'd never turned round to look. But said she, whoever it was, had told the whole truth. And this, I thought, was quite an admission from this lifelong labor Zionist to acknowledge that when push came to shove, her international socialist credentials were a delusion and her role in this sorority of socialist leaders a fantasy. Friends, I think you've got another five minutes. I wish to leave you with a question. It is a very complex question to one which I do not pretend to have a ready answer. And the question is, does Golda's experience reflect the reality of how Israel is perceived in the family of nations? Are we somehow different? Does an Israeli prime minister have to grapple with the thought that the Jewish state is indeed something of an odd state out in the family of nations and that the usual rules of solidarity do not apply. I leave that question hanging with this thought. Why is there only one Jewish state in the world? Why is there only one country in the world whose language is Hebrew? When there are so many Christian states, 
Muslim states, Hindu states, Buddhist states, English speaking states, Arabic speaking, French speaking, Chinese speaking, Spanish speaking, everybody in the world has natural family sharing religion, history, culture, language, everybody except Medinat Israel. And there are consequences, diplomatic consequences for what I am saying. For example, in the United Nations, votes are automatically stacked against us. Our Muslim cousins, number one billion six hundred million. We Jews are 13 million. On the eve of World War II, we were 18 million. And so, they can pass any vote they want against us. We, for example, we have no membership in any regional alliance, no full membership in any trade area. We enjoy no full international recognition of our official medical emblem, the Magain David Adom. We have no fully accredited membership in any United Nations regional group. And consequently, we're the only UN member that has no real prospect of becoming a member of the Security Council. And on top of it all, the bulk of the United Nations annual agenda, some 60%, is traditionally devoted to condemn us. Which leads me to this very final thought. If every Prime Minister of Israel is seized with a constant need for vigilance in our Middle Eastern tinderbox, each nevertheless has lived by the Jewish imperative of Bakesh Shalom Verat Fehu to pursue every avenue for peace. And if painful concessions are the price we shall have to pay for peace, this is all the more reason to reject the ignoble counsels of the spurious peacemakers who fail to distinguish between true reconciliation and fallacious substitutes. So pity I say the peace at any price man, the man who distrusts his own Jewish convictions, the elitist man who has lost the fighting spirit of Jewish survival, the ignorant man the man of dull mind whose soul is incapable of feeling the mighty lift that thrills the spirit at the realization that a new spring of Jewish renaissance is upon us. On April 2nd, 1979, Prime Minister Begin paid an official visit to Cairo where he was received with all the honors befitting a head of state. And the program included a visit to the Cairo Museum, which has, as you probably know, the largest collection of Egyptology in the world. And as the curator was leading us through one extraordinary gallery after another, galleries displaying Pharaoh's vast treasures, an astonishing array of ancient Egyptian civilization. One of our young Israeli security guards turned to me and whispered into my ear, all this makes you feel small, doesn't it? And Prime Minister Begin happened to have overheard him. And he turned to the young fellow and he said, Small? What small? The Egyptian civilization lies here, gathering dust in a museum, while we, with our biblical ethic, the Torah, have changed the history of the whole of mankind. And that Torah gave us eternity, which is why we are not a museum nation. We are an Am Yisrael Chai nation. And he ended patting the fellow on his cheek saying, Kach haya, so it is. Kach hu, so it should be. And Kach yihia, so it shall be forever. I thank you. Thank you.